our ancestors were right to be scared of the dark. Lock your doors, turn on the lights, because I... That was it. Those were my cousin Carl's last words. As much as everything in my mind and body told me not to, I uploaded the document. He wanted his story to get out there, and I wanted to respect his final wishes. That was the least I could do. Most people may call me a moron, but I believe this story. Every single word. Carl had always been a mentally stable person throughout his life. He drank here and there, but only in moderation. There was no reason to doubt he was telling the truth, even though it made my stomach churn. When I had gotten to Carl's house, his chair still had a dent in it from sitting down for an extended period of time. His laptop was open but went into sleep mode. And I tried to go through his TV's history and records to find the video that he was talking about, but the thing had been completely fried. I'm not even sure how. He never mentioned that happening in the document. My mind was racing, trying to think of solutions. I wanted to find Carl. I held out a false hope that he might still be alive, but what could I possibly do? I wasn't equipped to deal with this supernatural stuff. For God's sake, I'm a grocery store stalker. The most insane thing I ever see is people not being able to do simple math to calculate their change. But all that meant I needed to find someone who knows what they're doing. Someone with the skills, tools, and knowledge to help find where my cousin is. If he's still alive anyway. One Friday after I finished work, I came home and immediately ransacked every little crevice and corner of the internet to find a paranormal investigator. It should have seemed easy, I know. But half the time, it was just frauds or scammers looking to make a quick buck. My entire first night consisted of downing energy drinks and caffeine to keep myself awake while I surfed the web. That is until I came across Ethan Veldor. I read through as much as I could about the guy, his arsenal, particular areas of expertise and past experience. From what I gathered, he seemed to be very well educated and proficient with handling demonic and otherworldly forces. Things such as evil spirits, demons, and vengeful ghosts who had decided to overstay their welcome on Earth. I wanted to be as thorough as possible to make sure I was getting my money's worth. But I put my money where my mouth was and decided to give the guy a call. Hello, is this Mr. Veldor? I asked. Hey, he replied, his voice raspy as if he had just woken up. I'm guessing you're calling for business purposes. Yeah, I need help with the problem. One that I know you can handle. Alright. He paused for a moment. What little issue have you got in your hands? The emotion in his voice was non-existent. It's a little hard to explain. Is there a way that I could send you something? It's a document. It should give you the information that you need. Okie dokie, but before we get started, I need half of the payment now. And the other half after the problem is taken care of. That's just my policy. I became slightly frustrated with his dull responses. To me, it felt like he really didn't care too much about the actual problem at all. I couldn't blame him though. His job had to be undeniably exhausting and mentally damaging. Yeah, I guess I can do that. Do you have an email or something that I can send this document to? I continued. The rest of the call went as expected. He read off his email address and I proceeded to send over Carl's document. He told me that he would get back to me in two days or less, and to sit tight until then. Like that was going to be easy. Going to work the following day was aggravating to say the least. Not only was I dealing with my uptight supervisor and arrogant customers per usual, but I was on edge about Ethan getting back to me, which only amplified the irritation I usually experienced. I tried to keep my head up to the best of my ability. 
Hey Ryan, do you mind going into the back? We just got a shipment from the warehouse and the candy aisle needs to be restocked. My supervisor asked. Staring down at his clipboard, which was clearly only meant for show. Uh, yeah, sure, just one second. I replied as I finished stocking the current shelf I was working on. Also, he turned and stopped just before walking away. I need you to stay late tonight. It's getting close to Halloween and we've been really busy the past week. If there was a way to describe how much I was internally sighing and complaining, I would have gone on and on. But I just kept my mouth shut for obvious reasons and made my way to the back of the store. My supervisor wasn't lying. I could see tons of people doing last minute shopping for Halloween candy. Some of them being small children who didn't want to wait to trick or treat. I opened the doors to the back and was immediately hit with a blast of cold air. It was always kept at a lower temperature to preserve the quality of things like ice cream and milk. A moderate amount of flickering accompanied me as I looked around. We had needed to get some of the ceiling tiles in the back replaced for some time now. They were constantly flickering on and off for the past few weeks at this point. I slowly walked towards the south end of the back between the tall shelves. I could see an alarming amount of rust beginning to form on the metal subordinates. On my way to the end, I saw a sight that froze me right in my place. I tensed up, having absolutely no idea what to do with the unsettling image in front of me. Less than ten feet away from me stood a man. That's what it looked like anyway. He was a disturbing pitch black and shadowy in his appearance. I couldn't make out any facial features save for a pair of glowing crimson dots, where his eyes should have been. But his shape and general build was similar to someone I had seen before. I just couldn't put my finger on it. The figure stood in the dark corners of the back where the ceiling lights flickered the most, blending into the poorly lit area. You dare hunt us. It spoke with such force I thought the room might have shook. The thing even sounded far more demonic than it looked. Its voice reverberated and echoed as if he had a microphone resting in his esophagus. Adrenaline flowed through my veins but yet I stayed still. I was too stiff to move a muscle or make a sound. My mind was completely blank. Your efforts are in vain. The shadowy figure began to cackle in an unsettling taunt towards me. Despite there being no movement of its mouth, or any of its body for that matter. What, what are you? What do you want? I managed to get out, failing miserably to mask the tension in my voice. The lights began to flicker even more intensely. The room was slowly fading into darkness as I stood there in unexplainable panic. I tried to pull my phone out to record the insane events as soon as the screen lit up. The numbers on the digital clock on my phone were constantly scrambling and changing. It looked like a slot machine of a casino. I wasn't even able to put in the passcode. You can run and hide. We will always find you. Always. The figure continued on. This is not your hour, Ryan. I turned to run out of the back. I shoved my phone back into my pocket and practically launched myself through the doors to return to the main space of the store, desperate to get away from that thing. I looked back through the circular window of the doors once I was on the other side. The red-eyed shadow man had disappeared and the lights were no longer flickering. They were working just fine. Figures, I huffed. Are you okay? Came a female voice to my left. I turned to see my coworker Sherry looking at me with great concern. I was in a hunched over position with my eyes as wide as possible. Her reaction to my seemingly odd behavior was justified. There was multiple seconds of awkward silence between the two of us as I decided how to respond. Yeah, just almost tripped over. I lied, not wanting to drag Sherry down into my web of confusing nonsense. Uh, okay, right. She responded with a dry expression. Well, I was coming back here to grab some more stuff to restock the home care aisle. I didn't mean to spook you or anything. 
You didn't. It's okay, I replied, straightening my posture. I won't lie to you all. I had always found a sherry rather attractive. She dyed her hair a beautiful light red. Her skin was as flawless as polished marble. Her eyes sparkled like emeralds and she always had been fun to work with. By far my favorite co-worker out of anyone. Sherry had always been much more down to earth than her appearance would lead you to believe. I had been putting off pursuing any sort of romantic relationship with her. I wasn't usually a fan of getting together with people that I worked with. But lately, she had begun to change my mind. Fear of rejection had gotten in my way of ever officially doing anything other than casual flirtation. Well, I'm glad. Sherry chuckled. We've got our lunch soon, so if you want to meet me in the break room, that would be great. She punctuated her sentence by flashing me a friendly smile. Before I could respond to her proposal, I felt my phone begin to vibrate aggressively in my front pocket. I took it out with a hop of hesitation. It seemed to be strangely working once again. Full display on the screen was the phone number of Ethan Veldor, the paranormal investigator. Yeah, definitely. I gotta take this real quick, I'm sorry. I said as I held up a finger and slowly turned the corner. Taking multiple glances around to make sure I was alone with no one around. Hello? I picked up. Greetings, Ryan. Ethan responded, his usual monotony being present again. Greetings? Who says greetings over the phone? Uh, you know what, never mind. Did you find anything? I need you to meet with me tomorrow. He responded without answering the question. I'll send the address. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Did you find anything? I persisted. Ethan hung up, refusing to answer my question. I hit my fist against the wall in anger before realizing he probably had info if he wanted to meet up in the first place. A customer had walked by at that moment and shot me a look of disappointment, as if they were my boss. The rest of work that day went by as slow as possible after that call, but the highlight was having lunch with Sherry in the break room. It helped to lighten my spirits. But that didn't mean I couldn't get the incident of what happened in the back room off my mind. You've been okay, she asked before taking a bite of her vegan burger. First, you were scared like crazy, and now you're all spaced out. It's just been a really stressful week. Uh, Carl is still missing. I moaned, slouching back in my chair. I saw that in the news. Sherry glanced at me sympathetically. I'm really sorry. If you need a friend to talk to, I'm here. There was a pause before I spoke. I fixed my posture and sat up straight in my chair, making sure to look Sherry directly in the eyes. I appreciate it. Uh, listen, there's something I've been meaning to. I was quickly cut off by our supervisor storming in, a neglectful expression on his face. He was in his usual authoritarian delusion, always walking around like a tough guy despite being the shortest person in the entire staff. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but break's over, guys. Time to get back to work. Yeah, sorry, I thought. Because everyone believes that when you use it as an excuse for the millionth time... When work had finally finished up and I went home, I stayed up all night, mindlessly scrolling through Netflix as I desperately tried to get some sleep. I felt the fatigue behind my eyeballs, yet they refused to close and let me drift off into unconsciousness. I did end up falling asleep that night, but for less than two hours. It was a struggle to just climb out of bed that morning and get ready to go meet up with Ethan. But the morning light shining through my windows helped to give me the last bit of motivation that I needed. One thing that always puzzled me about Carl was why he enjoyed the night so much. His late night walks were a far cry from what I would have done. He always seemed so excited to do it. I never understood why. The location Ethan had given me to meet him at was surprisingly a library of all places. Call me naive, but it seemed a little too normal for someone like him and his so far cryptic tendencies. Speaking of which, it was a pain to find him in there. 
and I scanned up and down the interior several times with no luck. In my mind, he should have stood out. I guess not. Where the hell are you? I whispered out loud to myself, darting my head around like a crazed pigeon. I was caught off guard when my phone began vibrating for me, receiving two text messages. I retrieved it out of my pocket and took a glance to find both of them were from Ethan. Behind you, the first one read, You need glasses or something. I did a 180. There Ethan sat between two of the non-fiction bookshelves with his face buried in a novel about the history of supernatural sightings and folklore. I casually went up to him, putting up a front of false courtesy. You're Ethan Veldor? I asked. It's good to finally see you up close. Sure, came his dry response. Sit down, I've got something to tell you. I hesitantly sat in the beanbag directly parallel, a look of eager anticipation all over me. What is it? I've been waiting all night for this. I interrogated. These nocturnals, they're nothing like I've ever encountered. It's been a pain in my behind to learn anything about them. I've only been able to gather less than half a page worth of information. The rasp of his voice boomed across the library for a man speaking so quietly. Aren't they just like ghosts? Ethan snickered, the closest sound to a full-on laugh that I had ever heard him produce. No, not even close. I even tried getting ectoplasm from them. Nothing. The typical baits, traps, and everything are useless. They don't bite. In Carl's document, he said something about them needing to be in some sort of darkness. Well, that's true. But one of the few things I did find out is that, when they have their sights set on someone, the darkness becomes less and less of a prerequisite for them. And right now, they've got their eye on you. I gripped the arms of my chair as he said it. I couldn't help but feel as if all the fluids in my body ceased to flowing. One of them, I saw one of them at work yesterday. I could tell by how shook up on the phone you sounded. How do we kill them? Kill them? Ethan scoffed. You don't. You can't. We just need to find a way to... Wait a minute. He paused, standing up from his chair and beginning to scan the area of the room behind me with a moderately paranoid expression. What? What are you looking for? The light in the back left. It's flickering. He huffed while reaching into his jacket for something. It wasn't until now that I noticed a sizable imprint in his jacket. I stood up and placed myself in front of him, attempting to diffuse his angst and not draw attention in our direction. Would you chill out? I whispered. People are going to think you're nuts. No, they aren't. Have a look for yourself. I hesitantly turned my head. The library was just the same as it had been minutes prior, but every single person was frozen with the exception of Ethan and I. It was like they had all been stopped in time. None of them even blinked. They were complete statues. Don't move, Ethan demanded, reaching into his jacket and pulling out an almost alien-looking weapon. I had rationalized it as being just a heavily modified shotgun with red rings around the barrel and some sort of cylinder containing a strange purple liquid hanging from the bottom. The light in the back Ethan had talked about flickering was beginning to spread to the rest of them. They all hummed and buzzed violently as they flashed in and out simultaneously. Now the whole interior was starting to become an epileptic person's worst nightmare and the flickering of the lights made me come to a horrifying realization. I could feel my stomach churning. Are they here? I asked as I darted my eyes frantically around the room. Holding on hope that now frozen people would start moving once again. What do you think? Ethan replied rhetorically without even looking back. Just try not to crap yourself. The last thing you want to do is let them know that you're scared. Yeah, because I'm sure they don't know that already. I clap back. Aren't you supposed to be the professional here? 
the lights now all flickered at the same time. The bookshelves began to shake as the floor now rattled. Books fell off the shelves and the chairs were tipped over. I could feel the air become icy cold, as the eerie hum of the ceiling lights only became louder. You need to get out of here, Ethan demanded, putting a hand to my shoulder and trying to force me out of my spot. How? We're trapped. My best chance is here with you. I said go, Ethan snarled. The lights flickering came to a climax when it became too intense and they exploded. Shards of glass and plastic fell to the carpeted floor while the darkness flooded the room as a result. The light coming from the windows was covered with a sheet of powerful darkness. The opposite half of the room was completely drenched in a pitch black abyss. Even Ethan seemed to not know what was going on. I was terrified. I could feel my hands shaking intensely. In the dark half of the room, eight different pairs of red glowing dots stared fixed on us. I couldn't take my eyes off them, not even for a second. They didn't move, make a sound, or speak. They simply continued to glare hungrily at us. I looked down at the floor and nearly screamed, as I saw the darkness itself moving. It freaking moved, slithering across the floor as if it were given a body. I attempted to speak and scream, but no noise came out. My throat was closed up from the undeniable panic I was feeling. I thought I was going to die there and then. Stay back, Ethan commanded as the darkness continued moving its way towards him while he tried to fire his weapon, only for nothing to happen. He tried a couple more times to be faced with the same result. I had felt stupid for relying on him in the first place up to this point. What? What the hell? He cursed. Haunting laughter came from the darkness. It was a combination of multiple bone-chilling cackles. They were sinisterly taunting. Some laughs being children, some being men, and some were women. The red dots slowly hovered forward through the dark, getting increasingly closer to Ethan and I as the pitch black, almost liquid-like darkness swallowed up the rest of the room. It was closing in on the both of us. All we could do was watch and listen. Ethan attempted to fire the weapon one last time. And just like the previous efforts, nothing ended up happening. The only difference was that I was seeing a look of panic beginning to spread across his face. It only made my blood freeze even colder. Everything I knew about him so far told me that he wouldn't be afraid of anything. I thought you could handle this. I shoved him. Anger now coinciding with my terror. The void of darkness was now beginning to touch my feet. The volume of the horrific laughter increased as the glowing red eyes were now less than 10 feet away. It felt like this would be the end. I wanted to simply drop to my knees and give up, as a horrible death slowly advanced towards us. I felt helpless in a way I couldn't put into words. Ethan was the first to go. The darkness pulled around his feet. He lifted me with nothing but despair and desperation in his eyes, as he was suddenly snatched right in front of me. He didn't have time to scream. Not at first, at least. Once he had been consumed and pulled out of sight by the darkness, his screams were ear-shattering. I couldn't hear any sounds of him being maimed or harmed, but it was hard to distinguish these shrieks as being a result of paralyzing terror or pure agony. I chose the former. Two pairs of the red eyes now stepped in place of where he once stood. His blood-curdling screams were suddenly and violently cut off, after continuing for over 20 seconds. All I could think about was the potential horrific things they had done to him, along with the fact that I would very soon be next. The darkness had now reached me. It began to surround me, consume me, and I was left with nowhere to go. I was sure that this would be my haunting demise. Getting taken by these red-eyed shadow beings, the same as my cousin once had. I was fully surrounded by the darkness and I felt something grab me. It was hard to describe, but whatever snatched me up felt like it was all around me, everywhere at once. The grip of it was cold, similar to that of sleeping outside nude during a blizzard. 
I began to scream as I could feel the chilling sensation run its way through the inside of my body. Nothing but skin-numbing cold was all I could sense. I continued my shrieks as it kept spreading. The process was slow, agonizing in a manner no torture could ever compare to. I was miraculously lucky I was even able to open my eyes for a split second. All around me, I saw the nocturnals. Their figures were still pitch black and details completely obscured. But their eyes were now white instead of red. And it hurt me to look at them. I covered my eyes as I continued bellowing my lungs out to my chest. Assimilation. The voices of the nocturnals chanted as they all surrounded me. Over and over again as the feeling of that same overwhelming chill spreading through my veins finally came to a merciful end. It was only seconds after when I had passed out. When I awoke, I took a deep breath. I was in my room and the lights were off and everything was eerily silent. Morning light was leaking through my curtains but they were shut. The main thing racing through my mind was how I even woke up in the first place and how long I was out. Why was I even still alive? I should have been freaking out much more than I was. That's what I thought anyway. I exited my bedroom and marched down to my bathroom. The light was already on, which irritated the morning grog in my eyes. I quickly switched the light off, only letting a small amount of it seep in through the window. I looked in the mirror to see that I was completely unscathed, save for my crimson and bloodshot eyes and a few bruises on my forearms. I had wondered if the same had happened to Ethan. I pulled out my phone and attempted to call him, only for it to go to voicemail several times. That was when I was going to try to call the police and file a missing persons report. Right before noticing the time and immediately spiraling into a shallow pool of stress. It was only minuscule compared to what I felt when this situation usually occurred. Crap, I said. I gotta go to work. When I spoke, my voice was enhanced, amplified, whatever you would call it. I said a couple more words and phrases just to make sure what I was hearing was real. Every little noise or verbal outburst I created had echoed throughout the walls of my house. I did everything in my power to chalk it up to my mind and senses being distorted from what had taken place. It was still fresh in my mind. Yet even though I couldn't stop replaying it to my head, I didn't feel as strongly as I should have. As mentioned before, I grabbed my shoes and got on my car before hesitantly driving to work. Stepping outside was harsh. It didn't burn exactly, but it caused me moderate internal irritation. I felt out of place from the moment I woke up. Seeing Sherry at work didn't change a thing. I didn't care much for her presence. Every word that came out of her mouth was over my head. I paid her next to no attention. That is until she uttered the words. Ryan, why are your eyes so red? In my mind, I thought her question was trivial and maddening. I turned and simply looked at her without saying a word. I just stared into her eyes as I reached over one of the shelves. Hello? She persisted. Ryan, are you okay? Once again, I ignored her. I went about the rest of my shift, half-assing nearly everything I did. I couldn't wait to get home, turn off the lights, and relax. The store wasn't even busy by an average day's standards. Nonetheless, I was beyond exhausted. Arriving home that evening, strange feelings and emotions rose inside me as nighttime approached. The light was seriously starting to hurt my eyes. I really needed to dim it. I'm going to finish writing this now. The light from the screen on my laptop is slowly becoming a burning sensation and I can't take it anymore. I don't want to look at the screen for a second longer. But tonight, I'm going to pay Sherry a visit. These voices, they've been encouraging me to do so. One of them even sounded like Carl just like him, but distorted like me. I kind of like it that way now. It's soothing. The dark isn't so bad, you know. 
Maybe everyone should take the time to shut their lamps off and find the peace that doesn't exist with the light. The light is overrated.